Uh, first uh, bill on the agenda today is House File 5247. Uh, we've got Chair Gomez ready to go. Uh, Chair Gomez moves that House File 5247 be laid over for possible inclusion in the 2024 tax bill. Chair Gomez, to your bill. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Norris. So, um, yeah, I'm pleased to uh, be presenting Governor Walz's 2024 tax budget bill today. It's uh, pretty pretty simple, has a few um, important um, components to it though, and it, you know, I'll just turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair, but obviously I have the commissioner with me to go over the details. Thank you so much. Great, thanks Chair Gomez, and uh, we're glad to have Commissioner Marquardt back with us. Commissioner Marquardt, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I am Paul Marquardt, Commissioner of the Department of Revenue, and thank you for allowing me to testify on House File 5247, Governor Walz's Supplemental Budget Bill. Chair Gomez, thank you so much for uh, carrying the bill. Uh, and I uh, also want to thank the House uh, and now the Senate uh, for moving the NOL along. I, I think it's on its way to the governor's desk, so uh, good work to all. So just kind of overall on the governor's, and I was here a week or so ago, and so uh, I'm not going to go over everything, but I'm going to concentrate on the big part of the bill. And just overall, uh, the entire governor's budget was $199 million in the first biennium and $27 million in the second biennium. So the overall supplemental budget is very modest and <coughs> the governor has said is we need to be cautious as we move into this session. But one big note was the largest single item out of that $199 million was the $45 million for the child tax, tax cut, uh, tax credit uh, payment protection pilot program. That's $45 million. And so that is really the big part of that. And I think when you look at how big of a part that was in the budget, really reinforces <coughs> Governor Walz's and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan's commitment and the legislature's commitment to making uh, the state of Minnesota the best state in the nation for kids and families. And as part of that, to eliminate child poverty. So in this uh, tax bill, uh, in the first year, there's 61.6 million in the first biennium and 4.8 million in the second. And if you look at the global targets that have been agreed to, this is very close to those. So if you look at the global targets, it's 53 million, but that doesn't include the NOL, which this governor's budget does. And if you included that, that'd be like 68 and then 5.2 into the tail. So it's, it's very, very close. So what I want to do right now is talk about, again, the big priority here, uh, and that is the Child Tax Credit Payment Protection Pilot Program and why it's important. So I just have to back up again. And last year, uh, the governor and legislature uh, passed a nation-leading child tax credit. And according to Columbia University, this will cut child poverty by 33%. And that has huge ramifications in terms of higher educational achievement, uh, better wage growth into the future, uh, stronger workforce, better economy, better health care outcomes, better social justice outcomes, all sorts of things. So the child tax credit is really, really important. And that started this year, and as today, uh, $437 million have been claimed uh, for the child tax credit benefiting uh, 370,000 children, and the average family benefit is about $2,100. So child tax credit is off and running. Studies show that one way to enhance the effectiveness of the child tax credit to lower child poverty is by having advanced periodic payments. And so the legislature last year authorized the commissioner to come up with that. And so next year, starting in tax year 25, uh, with the great help of the, our advocates uh, that have helped formulate this, we will be starting an advanced periodic payment. The final details haven't been decided, but basically it'll be about a 50% 
advance credit of the previous year's credit. So if you're getting $3,500 for two kids maximum, you get $1,750 in advanced uh, payments. Uh, so we want to make sure that folks opt in and take the advanced child tax credit because we know that enhances the ability to lower that. And so uh, the biggest obstacle for people getting into the advanced child tax credit uh, is the fear of having to pay that advanced credit back if they get an income cr increase during the year. And we know that because of um, data that came out after the advanced earned income tax credit on the federal level that went from 1979 to 2011, only 3% used that advanced credit. And one of the major reasons the report said it was the people were hesitant to get into the program because of the fear of having to pay that back. In the state of Colorado, in Chicago, they also had advanced payment programs. And in those two studies also, one of the greatest obstacles for people getting into the advanced uh, was the fear of having to pay that back. So that's why the governor and lieutenant governor has this proposal, uh, working with advocates uh, to provide what you would call a safe harbor, to be able to um, guarantee a 50% minimum credit based on 50% of their previous credit. They would be guaranteed that regardless of what their income did unless it went over some limits that we have. But what it does, it would allow <coughs> parents to go from a part-time to a full-time job, which was one of the major things that we found in these pilot programs, that they move from a part-time to a full-time, or uh, a spouse or someone getting a new job, or whatever that is, you're not worried and stressed out about that occurring. And so uh, the income limits are, you would not qualify if married joint filer, you go over 60,100 for one child and that increases by 9,000 for every child you have. And if you are other filers, it'd be 49,570. This is a four year pilot program at a cost of $45 million, roughly about $10 million a year. And again, the reasons for this is number one, to increase participation in the advanced child tax credit, because we know that enhances the ability of the child tax credit. It reduces parental stress during the year, and studies show stress also impact the kids. And it allows a kind of an incentive for increasing the income as the year goes on. And so, you know, $10 million, uh, I think, and the governor strongly, and lieutenant governor strongly believes this is a very good <coughs> investment. Because we know that if we can eliminate child poverty in the state of Minnesota, this will have transformational impact on citizens around this state. And let me just kind of put a little data on this, how important it is to eliminate child poverty if we can. There's been a number of studies, the National Academy of Science, uh, one done at Georgetown University, one done at Washington University in St. Louis, one done at Stanford University. And what they have concluded is that this costs our economy, the fact that you have child poverty. And they estimate that cost of about $500 billion to $1 trillion a year. Roughly 4 to 5% of our GDP is lost. And it makes sense because with child poverty, you have less kind of wage strength. You have uh, not as strong of a workforce. You have a little bit of a slower economy because you don't have that productivity there. You have worse health care outcomes, which lead to more health care costs. You have more criminal justice costs. So the lost revenue increase in costs, they're saying it's 4 to 5 percent of our GDP. So what could that mean for Minnesota? So Minnesota has a lower poverty, child poverty, than the rest of the states. But let's say instead of four to five percent, let's say it's just one percent. Let's say if we eliminated child poverty in Minnesota, it would increase our GDP by just one percent. 
So what would that mean in the state of Minnesota? That would be an increase in our GDP or economic output of four to five billion dollars a year. That's like uh, building four or five new Viking stadiums every year. I, I know. I, I didn't want it, but I needed to put that in perspective. <laughs> so, and according to the budget forecast that just came out, the total personal income is about $428 billion in Minnesota for 2024. Take 1% of that, that's over $4 billion. And if we bring in $15 billion a year from income taxes, 1% is $150 million that that could increase just those revenues because you have higher wages, stronger workforce, more profits, better economy. We're talking just 1%. Add on to that sales taxes because of a more robust economy. Add to that corporate profits because of a more robust and stronger workforce. Because of stronger uh, health care outcomes, you'd have less health care costs, less costs other places. So you're looking at $10 million here for this, basically the safe harbor that is really going to enhance and protect this program that we know studies have shown can reduce child poverty. And you know, the potential benefits of eliminating child poverty in Minnesota are great. Uh, as, as I said before, I think it's transformational. And I think it's really exciting uh, on what the governor, lieutenant governor of the legislature have done in the last few years on what type of an impact that's going to have in the future on Minnesotans uh, around this state. And is it a monumental task to eliminate child poverty? Yes. But we have a great start to do that. <laughs> And so I think it's important that we have all hands on deck when it comes to the child tax credit. I think uh, we need to make the child tax credit as effective as it can be. <coughs> and the CTC payment protection pilot helps do that. And so uh, if we get this right, the results could be amazing for not only the families who are in poverty and lifting them out of poverty, but for the quality of life for the entire state of Minnesota. So uh, members, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I can talk about more in the bill I think I did the other day, and, and, but this is really the big thing. And that's why uh, having this safe harbor in place is just absolutely crucial to the success and effectiveness uh, of lowering child poverty on this child tax credit program, which we're leading the nation right now. Let's just continue. I know this is a huge task, but we can do it if we have all hands on deck. So thank you, Mr. Chair and, and members. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Marquardt. Uh, we're gonna go to a couple of other testifiers first, and then I know we've got an amendment and we'll have member discussion at that point. Uh, next up is Nan Madden from the Minnesota Budget Project. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Nan Madden. I'm director of the Minnesota Budget Project, and I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak today on the provisions of this bill related to successful implementation of the Minnesota Child Tax Credit. As you know, the 2023 tax bill created a nation-leading Minnesota Child Tax Credit more than one third of Minnesota families with children are estimated to qualify, which means they'll be better able to afford the basic expenses of raising thriving children. The 2023 tax bill also permitted the Minnesota Department of Revenue to establish a process for families to choose to receive a portion of their child tax credit in advance through periodic payments instead of only in one lump sum after they have filed their taxes. Advanced payments gets money into the pockets of Minnesota families sooner and better matches up with how families pay their bills. Advanced payments are a successful approach that has been tested on the federal level. In 2021, the federal government temporarily expanded their child tax credit and delivered 50% of the value of that credit to families through monthly payments during part of the year. Families were better off and they faced less hardship in the months that they received those advanced CTC payments. I've provided the committee with a letter that describes a set of design principles that we and nearly 40 of our partners believe are important in implementing advanced periodic payments. 
These principles reflect learnings from hearing directly from Minnesota families as well as best practice recommendations from the field. The bill before you today includes important provisions that follow those design principles. Um, as you heard, um, one of the challenges that families face is the worry that by participating in advanced periodic payments, um, you know, there might be some negative consequence because it's hard for families to, pre to precisely predict their future income. Low income folks in particular may be um, relying on multiple jobs. They might not be scheduled for the same number of hours of work every week. Um, so it's, a, it's harder to predict what your future income is going to be. The minimum credit provisions in this bill protects families who have increased their incomes from one year to the next. This bill also recognizes the importance of having resources and the infrastructure for successful implementation. There are pros and cons for families for receiving advanced periodic payments. And for us to truly empower families to choose what's best for them, they need to get good information and have the ability to interact with the tax system and opt out if advanced payments uh, end up not meeting their needs. And while it isn't in this bill, uh, we think it's also important that volunteer tax preparation services and other organizations who work with families have financial and informational resources to provide support and guidance to families in making the decisions about advanced periodic payments and what works best for them. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and we look forward to further conversation about how to implement a family-centered system to implement advanced payments of the child tax credit. Great, thank you Nan Madden. Next up is Deborah Fitzpatrick from the Children's Defense Fund, Minnesota. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Norris, members of the committee. My name is Deborah Fitzpatrick, and I'm the Director of Policy and Research at Children's Defense Fund, Minnesota. At CDF Minnesota, we work with community partners statewide to help families access tax credits and other work supports through our Bridge to Benefits and Economic Stability, stability Indicator tools so that they can achieve uh, economic stability for themselves and their children. We're here today to express our support for the provisions included in House File 5247 related to the child tax credit, particularly, as has already been mentioned, the robust, effective implementation of advance payments and protections related to income changes. Through our experience uh, working with families uh, in networks across the state, as well as facilitation of several focus groups, surveys, and listening sessions across the state, we have heard overwhelmingly that the option of receiving advanced CTC payments is, a very, import is, a very, is very important for families' ability to budget and support healthy development of their children. Advanced payments more closely align to how families manage their lives and the many costs associated with raising a family. In order to make this option a reality for families, however, we recognize and support the administrative funding necessary for successful implementation. And while this option is important for families, in all our focus groups on CTC advance payments, families did express concern about how small increases in income might result in them having to pay back money to the state. Given these concerns, we do appreciate the inclusion of a minimum payment approach that provides greater predictability for families and addresses a potential disincentive to rejoin the workforce, take on extra hours, or a, high, a new higher paying job. On behalf of the families we work with across the state, we look forward to working, partnering with you and the administration to successfully implement advanced payments uh, of the state child tax credit and to ensure it advances our shared goal of creating a state where every child thrives. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Deborah Fitzpatrick. Any other members of the public who wish to testify on House File 5247? All right, seeing none, uh, Representative Robbins, I know you have the A1 amendment. Would you like to move the A1 amendment? Thank you, Mr. Chair, yes, I move the A1. All right, Representative Robbins moves the A1 amendment. To your amendment, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Chair Gomez. I am a supporter of the tax credit, and I'm a supporter of the advanced payment option. What I'm not a supporter of, if is this idea that we're creating a guaranteed minimum credit because I think it's not going to work the way it's being sold by the department and even by the testifiers here today. 
and it's going to cause the problems that people don't think are happening. So how it works in the current law as structured is you would get to keep, the, um, you get your 50% advance payment. And if you are under the income threshold of this, let's just use the one child number, 60,100, and you end up um, getting to keep that extra that we talked about last time, that's true. But if your income goes above that 60,000, it's a cliff and you do have to repay it back. So we are telling families that they won't have to repay it back if they increase their incomes, but in fact, if they cross over that 60,100 threshold or whatever it is based on the number of kids, they will. And so we've created a phase out and keeping the minimum throughout the phase out, but then when you get to the 60,000, it's a cliff and you have to repay it. And it's crazy confusing. So what my amendment does is it takes the confusion away and it expands who, it takes that 45 million that's going into the pilot and it's taking the 7 million that's using to administer this, which is a lot of money, and it's combining that and just saying, no, let's use that to bump up the thresholds so that more people qualify. And it expands into the middle class more. And so I know the goal is laudable, the intent is laudable, but I, I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding. People are being told they will not have to repay if they get this. And if you cross that 60,100, you absolutely are out of the safe harbor and will have to repay. And that is a disincentive for people to participate, as we've seen in these other studies. It's a disincentive for people to earn more money and better their um, uh, fiscal uh, household income. So I, I think we're misrepresenting um, how this is going to work in practice, and I think it would be cleaner and easier for families and for the state to just put that $45 million plus the $7 million into expanding the, the credit itself. That's the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Robbins. We've got a list started, but first, if uh, Chair Gomez, you want to respond? Or I can go last. I don't okay. know what you would like me to do. It's up to you. That's fine. I'll just, maybe we can have the discussion and I'll go last. If you don't okay. mind, Mr. Chair. Yep, no problem. Thank uh, you. Next, Representative Kosnick. Uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, I think I'll just speak on the bill overall at the end. Mr. I, Chair, I'm yeah, sorry. Representative I, Robbins. I have a bill and a constituent up in another committee, so if I fail, that's why I'm leaving. And no <laughs> disrespect to my colleagues, I'm sorry. But Chair, Chair Davids is ready to yeah. take it on. Yeah. <laughs> All right, any further member discussion to the amendment, the A1 amendment? <coughs> All right, seeing oh, none. I, I oh. would like a roll call. Roll call having been requested, roll call will be granted. <coughs> Chair Gomez to the A1 amendment. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that you're now a supporter of the credit and a supporter of periodic payments because I just want to remind everybody no Republican voted for this incredible expansion of this credit last year. So, you know, if, if, if you've changed, if you've had a change of heart and you now like believe that we that we should do this, I'm very thankful for that. However, this is, this is you know, I, I think that the, the commissioner talked about, and, and the testifiers, talked about the value of periodic payments in people's lives. Um, you know, in, in 2021, I think it was the American Rescue Plan um, expanded the federal child tax credit. It was to, it, it, they increased the overall amount, 3,600 for a kid under six, I think, and 3,000 for a child between six and 17. Um, and and they, they did uh, kind of a similar thing to what we're doing here, 50% advanced periodic payment. And this was transformational in people's lives. This was really, you know, we're talking about folks who are, are really, you know, trying, trying to make things happen for their kids on very low incomes. And so a couple hundred extra dollars a month really made a huge difference in people's lives. Um, and, you know, it, it was the first time that, that, uh, that a, a tax credit, a refundable tax credit has been, um, had been administered like that. 
And, you know, it's there in, you know, there's, there's all this analysis by the Census Bureau about the impact on the month to month supplemental child poverty rate that you can go and check out, cut child poverty month to month by half in our country. Um, and, you know, if, if you speak to uh, probably some of us in this room, you know, ha uh, we're beneficiaries of that program. And during that really challenging financial time, it made a huge difference to people. Um, you know, I think that, that it's important that, um, you know, we don't get too, in, in our policy making, that we don't get too caught in our own experiences and that we were able to try to think more expansively about what it's like for those, you know, a family making $35,000 a year with a couple kids trying, trying to make their bills every month in the face of, you know, increases in price that we're all seeing regardless of our income. In, in, in basics, in housing and electricity and heat and, you know, groceries and all the rest of it. Um, and so, you know, this, the, the difference between, you know, a refundable credit that you get in a chunk in, uh, you know, February or March or whenever you're able to file versus getting a little bit of it each month can be really profound. You know, because if you talk to our advocates, you'll, they'll, they'll tell you about, you know, things like, um, people putting their kids back to school clothes on a credit card or getting a, um, you know, getting sort of a, a predatory uh, payday loan um, in order to make ends meet in anticipation of that chunk of money that if you're a low income person, you usually get in February or March or April or whenever you, you, you file your taxes. Um, and so, you know, of course there are, there are financial implications of using, you know, of basically borrowing money in order to make ends meet in anticipation of this, um, you know, of, of your refundable uh, credit that you get when you file your taxes. So this just, in, in the economics of a family, it really just makes sense. And so it's worth us doing what we need to do to, to, to kind of figure out, I mean, I agree with you in a lot of these, a lot of, a lot of things, like I would like us to not, to, to be able to extend this to everybody who gets the child tax credit. And I think that we should be moving toward that. Uh, also, to your point, I mean, this is a new this is a new administration. This is a new thing we're, that we're mm -hmm. asking our Department of Revenue to do, and so that's why it is it is a pilot program, and we are going to learn lessons and figure out how to make it easier to communicate with folks about and make sure that we iron out any um, you know any kind of problems that we encounter when we're doing it. But but you know. And I'm glad, you know, of course, if we had an unlimited amount of money, we know that it's not just the lowest income people who are having trouble making ends meet. You know, our, we have a, the highest um, child tax credit in the country. It's $1,750 a, a, a child. Any of us who have a little kid know $1,750 is not the cost annually of raising a child, right? Uh, it's a little bit higher. So. I, you know, I, I obviously I, I agree that that you know there are there are definitely like a lot of other families that could be um, helped by the child tax credit if we were able to expand um, the income thresholds. And you know, I, I think that we did we did the best that we could within kind of the budgetary parameters that we had to ensure that we were you know really targeting it to the people who needed it the most, making sure that we were including you know families larger family sizes, making sure that we were. Um, including people who, who were excluded from other refundable credits. And so, you know, I think that we did a lot in the program design to try to make it as effective as possible. But, you know, basically like gutting the periodic payments, which have, which, which again, I just can't stress to you like what the federal credits, what the federal periodic payments meant to people. But gutting that program in order to temporarily extend the, tax credit a little bit up the income scale, it's just, it's, it's, I, I just uh, don't think that it's the right policy choice. And I'm really excited and thankful to the governor um, and to the commissioner and his staff and to the advocates for working so hard to try to, to you know, to, to get us to the point where we have this program design um, and to the governor for prioritizing this so much in his budget, because this is really going to make a huge difference month to month, day to day in putting money in people's pocketbooks on the kind of schedule with it, that their bills come, not just once a year, because the bills come every month. And so if we can move more toward the support that we have for low income families, aligning with the actual economic realities that people are living with, then that is all to the good. And so I would ask members to vote no on this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Thank you, Chair Gomez. We did have a couple of members uh, want to uh, chime in here. Uh, Lee Davids. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And normally you let the uh, uh, chair go last, but the, the chair said something that uh, can't go unchallenged here. Uh, when the chair said something like uh, no Republican voted for the bill, that's true, and that we've had a change of heart on tax credits, that's not true. Uh, a, a tax bill, an omnibus tax bill, is a behemoth. There, let me give an example. Anything that I put in it, of course, is very good and be supported by all. <laughs> that being said, there are many things, and you are gracious enough, Madam Chair, to put some very good things in that tax bill, but overall, a bill that basically wipes out an $18 billion surplus, spends another $10 billion, puts us in the structural deficit in the out biennium, I don't know how you, no, no Republican vote for that. That's a true statement. But having a change of heart on several provisions that Republicans uh, may have favored, I think is unfortunate. As chair, the longest serving chair of this committee ever, with I think a couple tied, I always try not to say Republican or say Democrat, uh, because then you get guys like me uh, with discussions that are would have been unnecessary otherwise. So there's no change of heart on what we support in that tax bill. I support a lot of stuff in that tax bill. There's a lot of stuff I couldn't support, and I couldn't vote for it. But I don't think there's any change of heart. First of all, you'd have to have a heart to be able to change it, right, Mr. Chair? Uh, so obviously, I didn't have a change of heart. Um, so I wish we'd just be a little more careful, because to say that all of a sudden we're supporting, like we support the whole tax bill, that's not the last year's tax bill. That's not correct. So I hope we're a little bit more careful on some of the comments we make. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lee Davids. Uh, to Representative Anderson. I want to, thank you. Um, I want to actually speak in the bill overall. So. Perfect. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, we'll go lastly to Representative Robbins for any final comments before we take the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Gomez. And, and to be clear, uh, uh, agreeing with everything Chair David said, there was a lot I didn't support in last year's tax bill. Um, so there were lots of reasons I voted no. But also, if we really want to help families, I think the most important thing we can do is reduce the tax rate. So I want to be very clear on that. But given where we are and that this is the chessboard we have, my concern about how this safe harbor is drafted is that it doesn't do what we are telling the public it does. And that is that they won't have to repay the minimum credit. Because they will if they earn more than 60100 and. So all the reasons of doing it the way you're designing it to get more people to participate, they will still have all those fears and hesitations or they will be disincentivized to work more. And so with that, Mr. Chair, that is why I'm bringing the amendment and I ask for member support. Thank you. With that, uh, Ms. Sabus will take the roll on the A1 amendment. Chair Gomez. Gomez, no. Chair Gomez, no. Vice Chair Norris. No. Vice Chair, Snor Vice Chair Norris, no. Lee Davids? Yes. Lee Davids, yes. Representative Agbaje? No. Agbaje, no. Representative Anderson? Yes. Anderson, yes. Representative Brand? No. Brand, no. Representative Elkins? No. Elkins, no. Representative Howard? No. no. Representative Howard, no. Representative Joy? Yes. Joy, yes. Representative Kosnick? Yes. Nick, yes. <coughs> Representative Lee. Lee votes no. Lee, no. Representative Liss Lagarde. No. Liss Lagarde, no. Representative Olson B. Yes. Olson B, yes. Representative Olson L. No. Olson L, no. Representative Pinto. No. Pinto, no. Representative Robbins. Yes. Robbins, yes. Representative Smith. No. Smith, no. Representative Swidzinski, excused. Representative Wiener. Yes. Wiener, yes. Representative Woody, excused. Representative Yuakim. No. Yuakim, no. Mr. Chair, there are being seven ayes, 12 nays, and two members excused. There being seven ayes, 12 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Uh, on to discussion on the bill. Uh, Representative Kosnick first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Gomez. Um, I'm still a little confused, uh, not completely confused, just a little. Maybe you can clarify on the 
tagline of eliminating a third of child poverty in the state of Minnesota. We had this discussion a little bit. I appreciate that we were followed up with some additional information on that. Um, why are we only eliminating a third of child poverty? Why not closer to 100%? Chair Gomez. Because uh, we're not spending a couple billion dollars, which is what it would take to eliminate child poverty completely. Representative Kosnick. Thank you. Well, I, you, you know, a lot of times around here we pass a bill and we say if it helps just one child, it would be worth it. But here we're choosing to leave out two-thirds of the children that are in poverty. Um, and we cite uh, some data here. Uh, do you know on, on the data the, with the, um, at the request of the commissioner uh, from Columbia University, do you know how large that, how that data was arrived? Chair Gomez. Um, just to clarify, this, as you, would, as you heard from the commissioner, this child tax credit has already helped 400,000 kids. So I, I wouldn't minimize the impact that this is already having in people's lives. As to the methodology of the Columbia University study, I, I would ask, um, you know, for uh, an assist from Mr. Williams probably on that. But, you know, it's a short memo. You can probably read through it and, and learn a bit, little bit about the methodology and the sample size, et cetera. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Chair. Well, in that sample, it says, given our... We caution that the Minnesota sample size in our data set is small. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should recognize that when we tout that we're going to eliminate childhood poverty by a third. Um, as the sample size of the Minnesota residents and children, or children in poverty, was only 139 kids in the state of Minnesota when, when this was done. So their estimates, this is by the people that did provided the data, Given this, our estimates should be interpreted with caution and are less precise than they would be with a larger sample size. And so I, I just think it'd be more transparent uh, to the Minnesotans that are expecting childhood poverty to be reduced by a third, that we're not really using great uh, size, uh, uh, ample sample size. And so I get a little um, <clears throat> hearing that we're going to reduce child poverty by a third all the time. It gets a little tedious when I'm not sure that I, I think the, the data shows that we're going to be effective, but yet we are spending, I think, $400 million was already put in there. So knowing this, um, in the bill, uh, last year we didn't have it, but this year you have, is there metrics that we can measure or reporting uh, back to the, this committee or the legislature on how effective this will be? Chair Gomez. Thank you. Um, so as you'll notice, uh, when the commissioner talked about it earlier and when I talk about this publicly, that what I say is it's estimated by a Columbia University study that it will reduce child poverty by a third. Certainly with any kind of um, projection, you know, there are caveats to it. Um, and so, that is a projection. That's why that's the way that we talk about it. Um, you know, there are like, a, certainly there are, um, you know, things that, that can, could influence that and that could, you know, there are other factors outside of the child tax credit that could raise or lower child poverty as we kind of discussed the other day. But as you know from reading the bill, there is not um, a study requirement in the bill. Thank you. Representative Cos. Well, Mr. Chair, I, I would encourage the author to perhaps try to put some constraints on there so we would know as a committee, as a state, as taxpayers of Minnesotans, how effective this is or isn't. Um, we did, as Chair Davids had mentioned, we did have a $20 billion surplus and we increased taxes $10 billion. We increased the size of state government uh, budget by over 40% this biennium here. And so we did have the opportunity. We could have tripled this and helped more kids. Um, and so when you're, if you're going to cite the data, I think if you're not certain that what I'm, I'm saying, that we could have tripled this and helped all kids in poverty, um, you should make sure that the data that you're citing uh, is accurately reflected and that it is a small sample size and there are other metrics. And uh, I still have uh, big reservations that the amount of investment that we are putting towards this 
uh, is not actually going to reduce childhood poverty in the state of Minnesota by a third. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have um, two questions. My first um, is maybe to the staff or to the commissioner, um, but I, I don't understand why we're setting up a child tax credit account um, separately from the general fund, why we need to, to do that. I mean, I understand why we need, you know, the $45 million to cover the payments that probably shouldn't have been made if the program was the way it was, but why are we setting up a separate account? Uh, Ms. Templin. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Anderson, um, in your packet, you should have a revenue estimate for mm -hmm. the governor's bill and our, excuse me, Representative Gomez's bill. And the, um, you can see on the revenue estimate, the, there is a transfer from the general fund or out of the general fund into a uh, special revenue account mm -hmm. in fiscal 25, and that's 45 million. That account is then used to pay for the child tax mm -hmm. credit in fiscal year 26, 27, 28, and 29. And the effect that that has in terms of the fiscal impact on the general fund is that it reduces the cost to the general fund of the payment of the, of the pilot, the child tax credit pilot. And, um, and so that account then um, is approximately 10 million a year is transferred to the general fund to offset the general fund costs. Thank you, Ms. Templin. Uh, Representative Anderson. Thank you. Um, wouldn't it just be more logical to just simply put the 20 million in for the next, this cycle, and then to deal with the rest in the future, rather than setting up a revolving fund, a special revenue? I mean, why? Uh, Madam, I mean, sure, do, Chair Gomez, yes. did you want sure, to? Sure, yeah, that? that's not really a question for fiscal staff. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a policy choice. I guess you could say, oh, one's more or less logical, but they're, they're choices that the governor made. So, I mean, I don't really, you can uh, differ for, uh, on, you know, you can have a different opinion than uh, the administration about how to structure it, and that's fine, but this is what they chose to do. Representative Anderson. Thank you. Is the commissioner still here? Uh, the commissioner is not still oh. here. Or is someone from the Department of Revenue here? Uh, Ms. Bears is here. See her making her way to the dais. I Thank you, Ms. Bears. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, members, my name is Joanna Bears. I'm the Legislative Director for the Department of Revenue. And Mr. Chair, uh, Representative Anderson, um, the reason is because this is a pilot program, so we wanted to take the money out for the pilot program and put into account so we knew it, was, it could be used and dedicated for this pilot program. So uh, that $45 million comes out, sits in that, uh, that account so that we can use it uh, each year for the pilot program, and then you know, the remaining would go back to the general fund if it wasn't used um, after the pilot program was done. Representative Anderson. Okay, thank you. Um, I won't come it up. I do have, so I'll, my second question will be directed at um, Ms. Bears too, that um, it would also seem to me that if, if, if you set this up so it was paying forward rather than, or paying backwards, rather than um, right now, you're, someone would get a refund, they'd get the child tax credit next February when they filed, then they're starting their payments after that, then they're, worried about this, we're spending a ton of money on administrative costs, we're, you know, we're creating a whole new program. Um, if, as the Chair Gomez um, stated, which I agree with, that there's a value in periodic payments and the difference is profound in periodic payments, why have you, has, but did the department think about structuring this so that the payments are actually made after someone files their taxes. Rather than getting a lump sum in February, they're made over the course of the next 12 months. It's the same dollars. It eliminates this entire problem. It solves the, you know, um, the Chair Gomez talked about, about periodic payments versus a big check 
once a year. Did, was there discussion at the department about that? Ms. Bears. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, there was a lot of, a lot of discussion that happened uh, to try to find something that would work. And I think, you know, we looked at, you know, doing these advance payments. We looked at looking back at the, the payment that's been made. You know, one of the, the reasons we don't want to do that look back and take that payment or that credit that you would have gotten and paid it out is because that's money we're holding on to longer than we need to be holding on to it. So we want to make sure folks can get the money that is earned or what they can claim as soon as possible. And so you have to kind of look forward in order to do that. Okay. I won't ask any more questions. Thank you. Representative Joy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chair Gomez. One of the things, you know, when I look at this and I hear what you're saying about getting money back in people's pockets for the child poverty, every like on a monthly basis, not more, less, waiting until the end of the year and keeping fingers crossed when the taxes come. And that, um, I guess I would encourage moving forward, we should really look at that lowest tier tax bracket about dropping that because what will happen is when people take their paychecks home, they're going to see more in their pocket on a weekly, bi-weekly, on a monthly basis. And, and I think that would also impact families and child poverty if we would look at redoing that tax bracket. I know it's going to cost more and that's going to be the big factor and everybody will get it. But I really think as people are struggling in Minnesota right now and not, I mean, with child tax rate, everything, I think it's great what you're doing and getting money back to people so they can live month to month. But I also think we should really consider looking at dropping that lowest tier tax bracket so that people feel it in their paychecks every time when they get it on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. Thank you. Thank you. Representative you, Akeem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to thank Chair Gomez for carrying the governor's bill. Like all good chairs do, we always carry the governor and lieutenant governor's bill for a discussion, which has been a robust one. Um, and I, I also want to kind of remind us in taxes, sometimes we think of things in a silo, but I know you don't. And I know when we talk about child poverty, we talk about it across all our different areas. So when we talk about um, decreasing child poverty by a third, we're also talking about the investments we made in housing. We're talking about the investments we made in health care for kids to have access so they can start out their life healthy. We're also talking about investments in transportation so their parents can get to work. We're also talking about investments in childcare so their parents can work. We're talking about investments in education, um, universal meals in and of itself, um, feeding kids when they're at school. All of that goes into how we look at um, helping children and families out of poverty. So not just the child tax credit, which lifts up a tremendous amount, and it's been proven at the national level as well during COVID, but just looking at our whole budget as a whole in Minnesota and what we've done, um, I would hazard a guess it's probably more than a third. So thank you, Chair. Uh, Lee Davids. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll pass. All right. Uh, anything, uh, any final remarks, Chair Gomez? Just uh, appreciate the consideration by the committee and uh, thank you to the governor and the administration for bringing this bill forward. And with that, Chair Gomez renews her motion that House File 5247 is laid over for possible inclusion in the 2024 tax bill. The bill is laid over.